Well, we'll get started. Uh, welcome to our discussion on upgrading. Uh, my name is Charles Bitter. I work for Comcast. And they've asked me to moderate uh, this panel discussion. So we'll uh, jump right off and do a quick introduction to each of our pan panel members. So we'll start right here. All right. Hello, uh, my name is Siddharth. I work for VMware. I'm actually on the uh, implementation of the, in the team implementing the upgrade for VIO. So I have a different perspective. My name is Mark Velker. I'm the OpenStack architect at VMware. Uh, hi, my name is Basil Baby. I'm with the cloud engineering of uh, um, Comcast. Hello there, folks. My name is Stephen Dake. I work for Cisco Systems, where I'm bringing containers to OpenStack. I also am the Cola PTL and worked on Magnum briefly uh, for about two cycles, as well as started the Heat project in the past. Hi there, my name is Tom Howley. I work in Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I'm working on the lifecycle management team, so that's kind of primarily involved with you know deployment and upgrade of OpenStack. Hello, my name is Michał Jastrzemski. I work for Intel, and uh, I'm a part of Cola core team, and I wrote uh, most of the uh, Cola upgrade logic. And I'm Jan Grant, uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, uh, also working on the HLM team, um, dealing with deployments and upgrades. You grab the mic, please. So that's our panel. Um, before we start, we'd like to get an idea about our audience, even though you're kind of dispersed. Who in the audience, and keep in mind uh, we can barely see, who in the audience actually operates an OpenStack cloud? And who has ever upgraded OpenStack? Who hated it? All right. Who wants to? Deal. Cool. All right, so my next question is for each panel member. Take about two minutes and explain what kind of cloud you upgraded, what version did you go from and to, and just some basic considerations around that. All right, so, uh, well, essentially, uh, we helped upgrade OpenStack Cloud for some of our customers who have deployed it in production. And uh, we basically upgraded from uh, IceHouse in our version one of the product to Kilo through your jumping release. And we did uh, upgrade to Kilo for them. Uh, in terms of uh, the challenges, I guess. Well, it, for the for us, I mean, essentially, one of the important part was, uh, you know, with our customers, consideration considering that they were deploying, they were in production with that. We had to kind of plan out in terms of what sort of requirements we had to kind of clearly lay out. Uh, what additional requirements do we need for them before even they start with the upgrade? Uh, because we wanted to make sure that they succeed with the very first time when they try and do it and they don't have to go back uh, and, and do, you know, put off the fires along off the way. So that was very important for us, and I think, uh, you know, so far for our product, uh, you know, with our customers' experiences, it has been really very good. Uh, in fact, some of our customers, they actually went ahead and been brave enough to do it themselves without even telling us, and they were quite successful with that, so which is actually very, uh, very positive for us. Yeah, um, so we um, uh, we did our upgrade on from Havana to Ice House. Um, so it was uh, it was on a pr full production environment on multi-region. Uh, uh, so the challenges side, uh, uh, since it's production and a lot of customers, uh, the workloads were really different. Like uh, mm, uh, we have uh, uh, connected boxes directly to the VMs. Um, so uh, uh, the planning part. Uh, it took took some good time to plan the um, plan the upgrade, see it in really uh, action, uh, port some of the data what we are seeing it in production in the lab, uh, uh, do the same kind of deployment uh, methodology on the lab, and then upgrade and see like how it works, collect all the data, what breaks, iterate through that again, uh, do the upgrade like uh, many times. So um, the the, the, the the main challenge was uh, 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 since it's production and getting a lot of uh, production traffic from diversified tenants. So that was the main. Yeah. 
Thank you. So we have, uh, I have personally upgraded from Liberty of Cola to Mataka of Cola with running VMs uh, without any interruption of the system. Uh, Cola is a new project, so we're not upgrading from Ice House or Kilo or, or older distros, uh, distributions of OpenStack. Uh, I would say the, the key point or message I would make to people trying to do upgrades is uh, what often happens is folks deploy a system, they get five or ten folks together, and they deploy an OpenStack system, and they say, oh, victory, cool, we, we're all set with OpenStack. Uh, but they make a mess during the process in a lot of cases, and that mess is very difficult to clean up in an upgrade. So one of the key factors of Cola, one of the reasons that makes its upgrades so fantastically good is that it does not make a mess of the system. So there's no mess to upgrade, and that's really the key value of upgrades in Cola. Um, so I kind of two, kind of two parts of my our experience with upgrades. So originally we were running a, a public cloud. Um, so we actually the first region we had deployed was Diablo, and we did an upgrade by uh, jumping much later on to Grizzly in a separate region. So running that public cloud, um, we upgraded from Grizzly to Havana and through to Icehouse for most of the services, I believe. So. Um, I think that fed into our, we got a lot of experience from the problems we would have had because it was early enough days and an upgrade and, um, you know, I completely agree with what Stephen said. You, you need to deal with and um, think about upgrade from the beginning when you're doing your initial deployment. So more recently, as we, we kind of moved to actually providing a product, um, that we have an upcoming release, which is basically going to be an upgrade from Kilo to Liberty. And we're currently working on, on the Liberty to Mataka. So that's, that's kind of two aspects to our experience. One is in running a, a public cloud and doing it possibly more manually and running into lots of problems with conflicting uh, dependencies between packages and the various services. Um, and then I think we know we've dealt with some of those issues in our, our more recent up upgrade mechanisms that we've implemented for the, for the product. Um, so I upgraded. Uh, uh, OpenStack seems Havana actually uh, on the multiple occasions. I'm a more of a developer than operator, so I was more blank about uh, upgrades. And since the Havana app, uh, the old experiences I had, ga I gathered, and uh, I, that was the base of the Cola, uh, Cola automatic upgrade script. So in Cola, uh, all that all that experience was scattered and uh, wrote actually automated upgrades from Liberty to Metaka and li from Liberty to Liberty security patches as well. Um, yeah, obviously I'll work with Tom, so uh, let me just add to that. Um, with the initial upgrade in the public cloud, um, we had the fantastic luxury of um, opening up a new data center, uh, which obviously if you can manage that, that'd be great. And then playing a shell game with the, um, with the original region um, as we managed to sort of get our cohort stood up. That obviously is not on the cards for most people. Um, and I'd echo uh, what Stephen said. Yeah, the more you can containerize in whatever fashion um, your, uh, the software that you're running, the better. It puts you in a much better position. So let's, let's bounce off that. Let's talk about containerization and automation. Um, I know that the Cola project is all about containerization. Uh, and I, I'm g getting the theme that you don't upgrade without automation. Right? Um, so can we get a, a quick snapshot just so everyone kind of gets an idea of the automation tool sets that you used? I'll let Mihal do that. So, um, most, so let me start with this. Most importantly about why containerization is, import, is important from upgrade perspective is the separation of the uh, dependencies. So, for example, Big issue with uh, upgrades is I want to upgrade my Nova, but Nova uses also in version X, po uh, X uh, point Y. And I want my Neutron to be upgraded a day after when we confirm that Nova is actually working, but it also uses uh, this, uh, but it uses older version of Oslo, which means I cannot run my Nova and Neutron at the same time in the middle of the upgra of upgrade, which in essence turns out to be w uh, we need to upgrade every single service at the same time, which is disruptive, which is hard, 
and which is extremely hard, if not impossible, to roll back if something goes wrong. Um, in COA, or actually any form of separate containerization gives you the, uh, one service has its own set of dependencies, which means we can have multiple sets of dependencies coexisting at the same host. And that, in essence, gives you ability to upgrade just Nova, for example, which means the upgrades are more, more, more atomic, less volatile, and actually it's it, they are actually quicker when you consider that because you can because you don't need to deal with the conflicts in the in the process the other nice thing about call it is actually docker image based specific so docker uh, is that when you have pre-built images you can test them out prior to the uh, deployment so you can make sure that your upgrade works before you actually upgrade it and you don't don't download any form of packages in the meantime. So let you when, when you do upgrade and the repo uh, repository with your new version of packages dies, it will not affect the pre-built images, which is yet another way another way to make it more less volatile actually. So with Cola, we most we have multiple uh, multiple ways to deploy Cola. However, our main one is Ansible and. Uh, with Ansible, we have a set of um, set of play. I mean, we have a uh, we have a playbook for upgrades, which assumes that you deployed. De uh, assuming you deployed Cola with this, with Ansible, you can just you can just run the playbook from upgrade. And because of the atomicity of the upgrade, because we can do one service at a time, we could do it automatically. Yeah, we, we run into some of those same constraints, and we have a lot of the same philosophy, I think, um, about uh, kind of containing things and making sure that they work before we actually, you know, flip the switch and put them on in production. Um, we tend to think of upgrades actually as, as maybe not atomic, but more transactional, in that in most cases, when we're doing upgrades for customers, they have a set of things that they want to get upgraded. And if that's one thing, that's one thing, right? But it could also be 12 things. Maybe they want to upgrade every service from, you know, Kilo to Mataka. Um, so we tend to think of it as let's test that entire system all together and make sure that the whole system works before we turn the switch and, and put it on in production. And because of that, we do a, a blue-green upgrade pattern where we can actually um, get a, a control plane that we know works together before we actually flip the switch and put it into production. So that's yeah. we have a, a lot of the same philosophy there. It, well, it's, uh, it's, a, it's essentially a staging environment. And however you do it, the best way you could do it is to the upgrade one service, test it out. Upgrade the second service, test it out. I end up to the point of upgrading everything. So you basically replicate what you will do normally on production. And thanks to the image-based deployment, you are guaranteed to have every single thing in the very same way you tested on the staging in the production, unless you broke something yourself. However, uh, so uh, this is a, this is a, I mean I, I agree to it. You need to test the whole procedure. To make it to be, to be sure. Just to add, we you know completely agree with the the need for isolation of dependencies. We basically achieve that using Python virtual env. So it's not quite going the the full distance as container, but this definitely solved a lot of the issues we would have found in, in the public cloud experience in terms of complete con conflicting dependencies between different services. So. As you as you said, uh, it doesn't go as well, uh, the, the, to the length of the container because uh, there are C libraries. There are, oh, the, this is a significantly less of a problem than the Python libraries. There are hundreds of Python libraries in the requirements right now. There are only few, only several few C libraries, but to have the pro, the full separation, you need to go all the way. But it's it's significantly. I mean, it's uh, it requires more of a deploy uh, from the deployer to go all the way from day one. So we, we see a pattern, right? We need automation and we need isolation. And we can isolate at the Python library level, a Docker control, or a Docker container level, an entire uh, image level, right? So that isolation, I think, is super, super important for rollback. But how do you know to roll back? So tell me about how you test your upgrade. We'll, we'll just go around. Start right there. You have a mic. OK. Um, so. Uh, we actually test uh, upgrade both in CI and QA. Uh, we're in a slightly different position that we're now preparing a product. So whereas with the public cloud, we were looking at 
um, very regular cadence of uh, updates with small deltas. Now we're looking at maybe uh, one or two releases per cycle. Um, so we have some luxury of being able to um, test and test and test again, and we've got a good idea of what's deployed currently. Um, we've got quite a bit of flexibility in our deployable architectures. Um, so there's a why you know, fortunately we have um, amazing QA people as well, um, and that really can't be stressed. Um, stressed enough that they come back to us with all sorts of things and say, well, what, what about if such and such happens? And you say, why on earth would anyone ever do that? But it's something that needs uh, fixing and sorting out. Um, so the more flexibility you've got in your potential deployments. Um, obviously, if, if you have one particular sort of um, uh, virtualization technology in mind, or one particular kind of um, uh, backend storage for Cinder, you, with your own site, you can you can scope your testing. But um, I think the real thing is to, before you enter an upgrade um, live, you want to know damn well um, that it has a very high um, probability of passing. And whether you do that starting small with sort of a um, virtualized um, setup, we use much the same tooling for our developer environment um, using a Vagrant-based system, um, which is a reasonable fidelity model. Um, so our developers are using the same tooling right from the start as we then use on bare metal and so on. So we do it again and again and again um, to you know really find out where the weak points are, and those are the things you've got to focus on. So um, having said that we finished, you, that you finished the upgrade is not actually a trivial trivial uh, thing to say because we may forget about upgrading this one particular package on this one of the hundred nodes, and uh, that's the reason we need automation. With Docker, it gets a bit easier because to validate that we actually upgraded is we had this set of images at day one, and these are images valid for liberty. Then in Mitaka, it's this set of images, and in every single node, these images, uh, the Mitaka images are up and running, and everything was running in the meantime, and if everything obviously is running after the upgrade, you pretty much are done with the upgrade. So you can, you, your state of, state of your uh, cluster is very easy to get, to fi figure it out, which is not a trivial matter. So as for how I tested upgrade, well, I just did it probably dozens of times right now and uh, test, uh, deploy Liberty, deploy VMs, ping VMs, uh, make upgrade, see if everything's working and tear down, then rinse and repeat. Um, just to add to what Jan, Jan said, so we, as he said, we have a vagrant environment for developers to test deployment and upgrade, and we use that same tooling for CI. I think when we first introduced upgrade, and we, we did this early on, so with, with the first release based on our, our first Ansible-based release, we actually had upgrade pretty much implemented, even though you don't really need it until the next release. And it was a bit of a challenge actually introducing that across the various services. Um, getting an, your first kind of upgrade CI job to work. So we have a CI job that runs on many commits across the various repos. So as a result, we're testing upgrade thousands of times by the time you get, get to release. Now, as Jan said, because we have flexibility in how you can define your cloud in our product, you know, we're only test, we can only test a certain set of patterns and try and be smart. And indeed, one of the issues you get with this, you know, it's great putting stuff into CI, but you only have a limited set of physical resources to test. So you kind of have to be smart about what you want to test. And I think we're looking, you know, within ourselves to to streamline some of the CI so we can actually test more, um, kind of more intelligently on the various different services. So, you know, what are the issues with upgrading uh, Cinder? And uh, to be honest, actually, the, the more, ch the kind of problems we found in CI are not around upgrading OpenStack services, it's actually around upgrading the infrastructure services, so the Keep Alive D, HA Proxy, Procona. And you, we find some very interesting intermittent issues when you've run upgrade thousands of times, or even hundreds for, and what's been very useful is actually, you know, together with the kind of an elk stack in the background, building up stats to figure out, okay, this issue actually looks like it's, it's going to be important for us to address, as in it might happen on a customer site, because you can't you can't address every single issue that CI throws up. But um, 
it has been very useful as a kind of initial testing ground, and then obviously QA is 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 invaluable after that for kind of full testing on bare metal. Thank you. So I think one thing that's different about COLA versus other deployment tools is COLA is meant to be an upstream for other downstream products. What that means is people take COLA, they maybe make some changes to it, and they ship it as their product. Uh, as they do this, they qualify the upgrades. Uh, that said, we, we definitely want to qualify our own upgrades before that happens. Uh, the way we're doing this in this next cycle is we're adding co-gating jobs for Glance, we're going to add a co-gating job for Nova, and a co-gating job for Neutron. It tests the upgrade from one version of Glance to the next, or one version of Nova to the next, or one version of Neutron to the next. Uh, as well as a gating job for all of the deployments or all of the packages we deploy. Uh, so we will have that co-gating job. Those co-gating jobs will detect uh, failures in those services as well as uh, kind of our regular gating job which will detect failures in our infrastructure based around upgrades. But our upgrades are so simple and so straightforward. They were hard to implement, but they're so straightforward to look at now that they're done. Uh, I don't expect a lot of problems. Uh, that said, there, there could be problems. Uh, and I think it's really up to the downstreams that use COLA to make a decision as to how they want to test and qualify their products based upon COLA. Yeah, in a uh, Comcast story, like uh, um, uh, some of, I mean, a part of our infrastructure was already um, was built like uh, sometimes back. So like the survey released in like uh, this release cycle, um, I think 50% of the users are still on ISOs or behind, I believe. So uh, so we had the same thing, like uh, oh, even though COLA is good and uh, all those good things came after, so we are stuck on some of the um, older, um, some of the infrastructure where we are stuck on the uh, older version. So the testing part, like uh, for the question you asked, uh, um, we start with the Vagrant, like I think if you all are doing the same, so we start with the Vagrant. Um, and uh, then uh, uh, in our case, like we are using Puppet on these ISOs and when we are using Puppet. And uh, uh, we orchestrate through Ansible because we already have the manifest, so we don't want to rewrite or make, make a big change there. So we used Ansible to orchestrate the um, runs um, because in Puppet it is not that good in uh, the uh, uh, timing, like how to time the uh, runs. So, uh, and uh, in the production, while during the doing the production side, uh, we we are using Tempest uh, Tempest test. Like after the controller upgrade, we run Tempest test to make sure that the existing uh, clients are good and they are. Uh, we can create VMs or delete VMs. All those operations are fully functional. The control plane is really good. Then we'll go to computes one at a time or in batches uh, based on the region where the, the kind of workload we are putting into the region, and then we go in batches to do the uh, computes. So Tempest was really helping us, so we uh, wrote some, uh, some uh, custom uh, uh, Tempest ones to, to fit our needs, and uh, the rest of them we are using from the community itself, and uh, that was really helping us. So kind of interestingly, um, you know, we being in the product space, we don't actually always get to define acceptance criteria for an upgrade uh, because all of our customers wind up with different things that they consider to be working um, and not all of them are even directly in OpenStack's control. Um, so for example, we might have customers who actually want to swap out hardware as part of an upgrade to a new version of OpenStack. Um, you know, add new storage, add new hypervisors, add, you know, whatever else. Um, so in our case, um, in addition to, to some of the strategies that we've already talked about, um, one of the things that we wanted to do was have an open window where the t customers could actually go in and do the things that they consider to be um, tests for their particular use case, um, which again is kind of one of the reasons that we gravitated toward a blue-green upgrade. Um, once we stand up the new control plane, um, that gives them a chance to go in and, and break it however they want to um, and either say, yeah, it's good, now actually flip over to it in production or not. Um, and that kind of dovetails into your original point about uh, rollbacks being important. Um, because we don't always know those acceptance criteria ahead of time and because they're so different from customer to customer, um, it's really important for us to be able to very quickly flip a switch and declare an upgrade failed and get back to working very quickly. 
With a blue green upgrade, we can actually do that because we actually still have the old control plane. And the really nice part about it is even after we do that flip back, we've still got the new one that they considered failed. It's hanging around, it's not being used in production, it's you know, been cut off from the outside load balancers. But now they can actually go in and figure out why it failed. Because they can actually, you know, they've got it still there to do forensic analysis on. So it fell like a boss, right? Right. Awesome. So uh, we've, I've been leading this discussion for a while, but now it's your turn. Um, if you have any questions, we'd ask that uh, you use the microphones so we can record it. Hi, uh, my name is Aniket. I'm from Box. Uh, we're rolling out OpenStack Liberty on a massive scale at Box. And what worries me is when I hear a lot of OpenStack users talking about still being on Icehouse or being on Juno or you know even the few ones being on Kilo. Why do you think it is such a, such a problem for customers to adopt near uh, current releases? A any thoughts? So um, one of it, will, uh, ironically, will be because upgrades are hard, and they used to be hard, and used to be horrible a couple of releases ago. Horrible to a point uh, that you will lose your product, product you, you will lose the connectivity to your workload during an upgrade. So um, because the, up, the early upgrades was, was pretty much setting up new the new environment and telling your people to migrate on their own, and that's a very costly procedure, if not impossible. Later, upgra later upgrades were about migrating, life migrating to virtual machines, and that may not be possible. It was only like last two releases when you can do the upgrade without uh, significantly or any uh, with, without uh, affecting at all of your running workloads. So cost of upgrade will be my best bet. <laughs> all right. Yeah, I, I guess my perspective is a little bit different. Um, for for many of our customers, at least for a year or two now, I guess um, upgrade has been a problem that there's been sort of tractable tractable strategies for now. Uh, there, there's kind of a lot of lore in OpenStack about how bad upgrades used to be, and I think you're right. It's improved dramatically in in last several releases. Um, in our case, what we actually hear from a lot of customers is just it's working really well for us, and we don't necessarily need the new stuff that's coming up. So we just don't have a good reason to change. Um, so it's kind of a if it ain't broke, don't fix it more than say once a year. Got it. And I have a follow-up question for you about the blue green strategy you mentioned. That strategy essentially involves fencing off one cloud, right? Not the entire cloud, just the control plane. In our case, that's a set of virtual machines. So it's um, you know half a dozen or so uh, in some deployments and up to about 13 or 14 others. I see. OK, so that way you minimize the, uh, the infrastructure overhead of doing that. Yeah, so we have a pretty decent decoupling of the data plane and the control plane. Okay. And the only thing that we need to do um, a, a sort of duplication for is on the control plane side. Um, in most cases, that's like a trivial amount of resources. I mean, if you're talking about you know a dozen VMs for a cloud, that's not really very much in most cases, <laughs> as it turns out. Um, the biggest constraint we run into on customers is um, generally they want a couple of extra IP addresses. And as long as they plan for that up front, then it's fine. All right, thank you. Hi, thanks. I was uh, wondering about database versioning and upgrading of each services and their database versions. What does that look like, and are there any pitfalls? Yeah, OK, we can talk about that. Um, so in terms of database versioning, are you talking about like the schema migrations that happen between versions of OpenStack? Yeah. OK. Um, so in blue-green world, um, that generally defines what our uh, state sync period is going to be. Um, so basically, the, way, the, the, the sort of simplest way to do that in a blue-green upgrade is basically, at some point, you say, I'm ready to cut over to the new control plane. Um, that's the point at which I you know, maybe take a dump out of one database, run into another, and then run all migrations, right? Uh, or even just do that in place if you've got a, a backup or something. Um, that generally is the period where you don't want things to change. Um, it is possible, and I've seen it done in other distributed systems, to actually have data coming into both the new and the old schemas. Um, I don't really recommend it for a system like OpenStack. Um, and that's partly because we have a whole lot of different projects that are doing their own things independently of each other. Um, and it just becomes more complex than you would want it to be. 
How might you stop the changes, uh, the write requests coming to the database? Uh, sorry, can you speak up a little bit? How would you stop the write requests from coming to the database? Um, you said you'd oh, stop yeah. things from changing? How you, oh, how do, how do we stop the old instance? Yeah. How do you stop the new, new request from again? To yeah, um, so generally we, we advise people to basically cut it off at the load balancer. Um, for most for most everything, the the public um, interface to OpenStack is the load balancer, and in our case, it's also the, all our internal requests, like um, Nova talking to Neutron, also goes through an HA proxy pair, so we can generally cut it off there. So uh, let me add to the lately in OpenStack, I mean, let's, again, about two or three releases, there was uh, there's this idea of lockless upgrades that Nova implemented. The other services are about to implement. It's uh, the idea is that you keep your old database. I mean, you upgrade your database before you even touch the code, uh, which means the new code is supposed to be working with the old database. And uh, sorry, the new database is supposed to be working with old code and obviously with the new code. That being said, OpenStack services doesn't support. Uh, I, I don't think any OpenStack service supports our rollback in upgrade, in upgrade rollback of database. Which means you, when something goes goes wrong, I really suggest you snapshot your database before doing anything with it. And uh, but in ideal solution, which actually in ideal situation actually is pretty often, you just do the database migration prior to even touching the code. And once the migration is finished and your workload is keep running, uh, you are you, you you just upgrade your code. And uh, uh, and if it's not the case, then you need to just put the just put the uh, maintenance window, turn off the APIs, stop people from making any changes, upgrade the database, upgrade the code, start APIs. Yeah, I should add as well. It's a good point about the APIs. Um, one of the things we've actually looked at doing, we haven't we haven't personally implemented this yet, but um, one of the things that we've looked at doing, depending on how long that state transfer takes. What you may actually be able to do is is just basically hang the connections at the load balancer rather than cutting them off and returning um, you know error codes, um, and essentially then you've got requests that don't ever actually fail; they actually just take a, long, a little longer. Um, so you know there there's some bounds on that that I'm not a big fan of. I mean, if you have like a really massive amount of data to move and a lot of uh, you know you're skipping 16 OpenStack versions and really want a whole bunch of migrations to run, that could be a really long period. Uh, and most of your clients would probably rather you just fail. So, um, but it's it's a thing to consider. I think we have a kind of similar strategy around performing the the migration before we switch over to the new the new service. And to Mikhail's point, like there's until we we've implemented this across all of the services to support for um, old code working against new database, and we can't. There's no way around actually stopping your services at some point. And so there's nothing we can do until this is uh, there's a common mechanism that we have, that they have in Nova has been adopted across all the services and I'm not sure what what state that is in at the moment. So um, so the approach is not that Nova took is actually more political than technical. They j it they have, uh, I suggest you uh, if someone is interested Dan Smith from Nova it's Nova Core. Uh, Tim, he wrote a um, blog post on uh, about this particular thing. It's about just don't make a migration that will need to, that will lock down your database. And if you actually need to de delete something at uh, one release of the uh, of the deprecation, which it will be just which will end up you not using a column, but it's better than stopping your service. Um, so obviously it depends on what release you're starting from and where you're upgrading to, but could some of you talk about uh, the amount of time that you plan for an upgrade? Like is it for on your teams, does it take one month or a couple months or a week? And could you discuss that process a little bit, the, the timeline wise? Yeah. So let me break a little bit because uh, we tested an upgrade. So Cola makes it things significantly quicker. And um, granted, we didn't have heavy database load. We have pretty much empty database. However, on 60 or so nodes, physical running cloud, it took 12 minutes to do a release upgrade. It will be more if you have more data, obviously. But basically, 
unless you are now really really heavy on database you it should be less than two or three hours of uh, total of total process image based deploys really makes this faster uh, the non cola world uh, i can give you some perspective so uh, if if uh, if it is not on the the container world uh, things will be like a little more uh, difficult the planning you need more planning so uh, that's what we faced in the um, our part so um, uh, we plan like uh, the planning and exec execution total took like a month plus uh, uh, so it was multi region so we had to coordinate with the uh, the, the the users within the cloud was like a um, different kinds and it's a multi region so we had to do some sort of coordination of these upgrades so the uh, uh, so it was like a month plus. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, straighten something out. Um, so Mihal talked about the 25 minutes for deploy and the 12 minutes for upgrade and with the database. I, I really don't think it would take two or three hours uh, to upgrade a really heavy database uh, because the migrations are relatively quick. Um, but it might take 45 minutes. Uh, the thing is, we don't have to do a lot of planning with our upgrades because our upgrades are systematic and deterministic, item potent, declarative. I can go on and on about how technically they basically are always repetitive and work the same way every single time. So because of that, there's no planning that's really necessary in a in, in a container world, at least with Cola, maybe with other container deployment tools there is, but definitely not with Cola. Yeah, and, and to kind of um, tag onto that as well, when you think about how long it takes to do an upgrade, uh, I would submit that in many cases, what you actually want to think about is is two things: one, how long it takes to do the full upgrade, and the other thing is how much of that time is actually outage, because the two are not anywhere near the same. <laughs> So you know, when we're doing a blue-green upgrade, the time that it takes to stand up the green control plane is not outage time. Customers are still up and running on their old control plane. They can go test that new control plane. That's not outage time, because they're still running on the old one. It's only when we do that state transfer that there's actually any possibility of an outage time. Um, and you know, since you know, in our case, we can't actually determine all the tests that they may want to run, that works out very well for us, because we can still bound the actual downtime. And you know, customers can take as much or as little time as they want. Um, in terms of planning for upgrade, I think kind of useful comparison with, I think similar to what's, what's been said about color, we have a standard mechanism that we use for upgrade that, that doesn't essentially change between releases. And this upgrade mechanism is not just for OpenStack uh, release upgrades, it's also for you know interim uh, security patches, minor, minor updates, that kind of thing. And I just happened to be talking to somebody um, a developer that would have also worked in the public cloud back in the day, and he reckoned it was probably a, a couple of months planning in, well, planning and execution and in upgrading a service that he was interested in in the public cloud. So it's it's been a radical change. Once, you know, once we had a mechanism that we worked on for the first upgrade, once we'd figured that out, then it's it's literally just changing the input data in theory. Um, I haven't said that you will run into issues, but that's just issues that you need to solve at that point. You know, whether it's a an issue that's been introduced by that release, but the, the mechanism is essentially the same that we had before. So I will add additional, the additional caveat to this outer, uh, to this uh, downtime. There are two types of down, two types of downtime. One is uh, for control plane. The other one is for data plane, which is the actual VMs. And as for now, for liberty to Mintaka, we haven't seen any downtime cost to VMs themselves, which means VMs are keep running. They uh, they work. They network. The network is there during the whole process. For us, it goes for the uh, data plane downtime. Some of the services, Nova, uh, like Nova, is actually almost. Uh, I mean, it, it is actually rolling upgradable, which means there is no downtime during an upgrade for Nova. There are services that actually causes downtime, mostly because of incompatibility between schemas. However, all things considered, uh, with Cola, it was pre it's pretty much determined by the length of the data database migration. Apart from that, it's uh, minutes, minutes, minutes on top of it. So if I, uh, I'll give you 30 seconds then. The basic rule of thumb here is you want to be able to reason about the process. 
Um, and if you've got a, um, if you're installing a whole bunch of packages on a system, that is an extremely complex set of potential interactions. If you're talking about um, components of services, and you can reason about those um, in isolation, you're in a much better state of, to actually work out what's going on, to, to figure out what's going on, to plan, to understand, because it's all about comprehension, really. You know, when you're in the hot seat, you've got, you've got to be able to know rapidly is this good, is this bad, you know, and y decomposing things into the, into the right level of granularity, that's, um, that makes all the difference. Brilliant. So we're out of time. I apologize. If you still have questions, we can probably take them over here. And uh, thanks for coming. Enjoy your summit. <laughs>